Good morning. Get my screen up. Ladies and gentlemen, this case is uh, this case is not a homicide. The state has not proven a first degree intentional homicide. It's what everyone concluded on October 3rd, 2018. It was a suicide. And everyone who came to the scene on that day concluded it was a suicide. And they concluded it for a lot of reasons, including what you saw, which is a whole boatload of prescriptions that were laying around. Lynn was hoarded pills, and they were everywhere. Pills that were uh, no longer prescribed to her. And the pills were found in her system. She took all those pills. And they also, when the medical examiner did the evaluation of the stomach contents, pills were in there. It's a, what is called a polydrug overdose. When somebody takes too many pills, the com combination together creates, can create exactly what happened here. That is Lynn's death. And Dr. Thomas, when she was here, she said there was strong evidence. Uh, let me see what I this is the prescription medications in the living room. And I don't want to forget about what was seen was at the scene. Remember, people who were there that day weren't looking for eye drops. That wasn't on their mind. So there, the suggestion that there were no eye drops is not true. It's not proven by a fact. It's just an opinion. And when the people came in and testified, uh, law enforcement, they agreed with us that they weren't looking for them. And Dr. B agreed 100% eventually that there was, was a bottle of eye drops, albeit not the ones with tetrahydrazoline, the ones that she would use in her actual eyes, on the table next to her. But if you remember at the beginning of the case when the state was asking witness after witness, were there eye drops there, were there eye drops there, were there eye drops there, the answer was always no. But it wasn't true. And what was surprising is that even after Dr. B agreed that we had found the right, uh, the right bottle of um, eye drops that were on the table, that Detective Hoppy, when he got on the stand and he sat through this entire trial, still couldn't agree that there were eye drops at the scene, even though it had been uh, testified to by the state. But it's similar to the deputy medical examiner when she looked and she saw the kitchen wastebasket full of liquor bottles. Nobody took any pictures of liquor bottles. She said she saw it. She put it in her report. But nobody in law enforcement ever bottled, bothered to photograph it. That doesn't mean they weren't there. That we know was there because she saw them and put it in a report. Otherwise, they would be here today also arguing that there was no sign of any liquor. They weren't looking for it. But they noticed things that were all consistent with, with uh, a suicide. There's the bottle of eye drops. Dr. B identified it. We brought in the bottle. Those are eye drops. It wasn't collected. So the state says that they collected all this boatload of stuff. Well, what, how about that one bottle that was right there on the table next to bottles of pills? Of all the things you wouldn't collect, why wouldn't you collect that? To make it, it suggest that they weren't there? Thank goodness for one picture where we can find it. Because it wasn't collected doesn't mean it wasn't there. Because Visine or other types of uh, eye drops that also have tetrahydrazoline in them, and there's any number of them, you saw them as exhibits during the trial, just because they were not collected or noted doesn't mean they weren't there. She had tetrahydrazoline in her system. Now,
Lynn had water bottles. There's one. We can see caps for two water bottles. We don't even know where the other water bottle is. Again, not collected. Certainly, these things should have been collected, should have been available to be analyzed. You're going to charge somebody with the first degree intentional homicide, and yet you don't have the evidence to be able to test it, to look at it, to evaluate it. Sorry. Everyone at the scene concluded it was a suicide, ladies and gentlemen. It, it was a suicide. It looked like a suicide. For Dr. B to say a year later that the scene looked staged, how, how, can, how can we wrap our heads around that? If the scene looked staged, then on October 4th of 2018 when she did the autopsy, she should have been right out of the gate. Look at this scene. It looks staged. Because part of her autopsy, right, it was to look at all these photographs that had been taken at, at the scene by her deputy medical examiner. And the facts and circumstances, look at Lynn's body, look at how it was positioned, the, the, the drugs that she had spilled on herself. She saw all that on October 4th of 2018. She had a body next to her to compare the body that's next to her with what was fresh evidence. Hey, law enforcement, this looks staged. I want you to rush over to that home. I want you to go look to see what else you can find because I don't think this is a suicide. She didn't do that because it didn't look staged because it wasn't staged. And the suggestion that these, the, that these fragments uh, or powder pills that Lynn was obviously using to be able to take the drugs she decided to take, that because they were spilled in such a way it's staged. No. Dr. Thomas explained, it's much like eating, a, eating anything that has, that has crumbs, right? Whether it's a powdered sugar donut or something else that you're eating and you've got crumbs, they spill mm -hmm. on you. And there's no way to say that way the body was on, um, at the scene that, that there was no jostling or moving of that body between there and getting it to the medical examiner's office, because of course there was. Dr. Thomas done more than 5,000 5, autopsies. She's so very experienced at this. Said they're always going to be jostling of the body. From pulling her out of the chair to putting her... Uh, on, a, on a gurney, to putting it, the body in a body bag, to taking it in the car back to the medical examiner's office, and all the things they have to do, of course the body was juggled and jostled. Now when we were, when the medical, well, in the trial, with the plain view eye drops that were never gathered, that we established in trial, that nobody ever noticed because remember too, Dr. B, when she first testified, said there was no evidence of it at the scene. It's only when we saw it that anybody else saw it. If you're not looking for it, <clears throat> you don't see it. We learned though that in her belly, we learned through Henry Spiller, didn't we, that in her belly was a teaspoon of Visine, one teaspoon of Visine. And we looked at a bottle of Visine, and we learned that a teaspoon is about a third of a bottle. That's how much was in her belly. Dr. Thomas looked at the scene, and that's what, you see, that's what, um, when you get a second opinion on a cause of death and a manner of death, what the, what the second pathologist does is really take a look with fresh eyes at everything, everything. And what she looked at were, were the same things that, the, that Dr. B looked at. No, she didn't have the body in front of her, but there's nothing about having the physical body in front of her, of Dr. B, that led to any conclusion that, that Lynn died of tetrahydrosylene poisoning. 
But what she does have is the benefit of all the scene photos, all the autopsy photos, which we didn't show you, but there's, there's dozens and dozens of them as the medical examiner is doing her evaluation. She takes a picture of everything along the way. So that if there is a second uh, evaluation done, the second pathologist can see what she saw with her eyes. She also had the slides. She also reviewed the slides. She also has the toxicology and the reports and the medical records. She had all of that. And she told you that it is undetermined but strong support for suicide or even an accident, which can happen. Somebody takes too many pills, the wrong combination, can accidentally die too. As far as it being staged, this is what law enforcement said. Oops, just a minute. I don't know if we don't have volume for some reason. Plate and spoon away from her, but I've also brought back to her because there were certain pills she couldn't swallow. Physically, she couldn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd sit there and they'd come back up. Sit there and they come back. So, I mean, I went, it went both ways. As far as the pills she crushed, I mean, I didn't sit there and let her crush 20 pills in my presence. You know, I let her, the, the main few that she always did. Usually if I come back, there'd be more or different ones or, you know, you can tell by looking at a plate. You know, obviously if they're all white, you can't tell. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you, I know when I left every day and I'd come back and the pill amounts aren't what they should be. And then she always kept the pills on the side of her that weren't, that she didn't take anymore. And those were suddenly getting put up on the table. And she'd, oh, I, I grabbed those by mistake. You know, she'd make up stuff. And she'd act like she didn't, you know, like, oh, I didn't put those there. Or Lid crushed her pills. And Jean Tunnell, the neighbor who the defense called in, said that when she would see Lynn, she was usually drinking uh, two, bo oops, two bottles uh, of water, and she told law enforcement back then, despite what she might have remembered in court four or five years later, or five years later, at the time that she was interviewed by law enforcement, she told them that Lynn was suicidal and alcoholic, and that Lynn wasn't nice when she was drinking. Of course Lynn was nice many times. Of course, Jesse had a very good relationship with Lynn, and other people at times did, but when Lynn was <clears throat> drinking a lot or maybe using a lot of drugs, she wasn't a, ni a nice person to be around, and Jean, Jean said that. And the alcoholism is supported by the medical records. Remember, she had the signs of alcoholism that were seen by Dr. B., and testified to by Dr. Thomas. It was there. That's a fact. And, and remember Lynn being found at the scene. She's got expensive bracelets on, and there's water bottles around that presumably the state's theory is Jesse was trying to kill her with THC in the water bottles. If you're going to do that, um, why would you, one, leave expensive bracelets on her? Why would you take those expensive bracelets off of her, right? Why would you leave them? And why would you leave the water bottles? Like, any more than if you shot somebody with a gun, would you leave the gun? I don't think so. You wouldn't leave it behind. And would you keep calling the medical examiner for answers? So, yeah, Jesse knew that Lynn would take THC, take Visine, drink it, but she had a but, it, but she doesn't know how she died that day. Looked like a suicide with pills from a person who was unhappy. She kept calling the medical examiner, and the only reason the um, medical examiner stopped talking to her or their office wasn't because they said, we don't want to talk to her anymore. It's because the detective put a hold on it and said, don't talk to anybody anymore. That's the reason that happened. 
And Gary Verdon was here in court. He told you, didn't he, that he, and that was a friend of Jenny's. Sure, it's a friend. But he saw Visine from the get-go. He saw it in her garbage cans on the occasions that he was at her house. And you know what? If he was going to lie to you, he's under oath like everyone else. He's an honest person on the witness stand. I didn't detect any anything from him that struck me as dishonest. Objection. If he's going to lie, <coughs> why not go all the way and say, hey, I saw her drinking Visine. You wanted to make up a story to help somebody, that's what you'd say. Now, Gary helped Lynn move. He was he was in the helpful friend circle. The state puts up the friends. They put those two charts of friends. Well, well, Gary goes in the in the Jesse and Jenny, actual helpful friends who did things like help her move, help her move her mother's things run errands for her, visit her, visit her in the hospital. Those were that group of friends, her real friends, her real current friends. It sounds like Lynn varied friends from time to time. But remember when Gary was here and he talked about the phone call that he heard? He happened to be at Lynn's, at, um, at Jenny, Jenny Flower's home, and Lynn's calling. And, and you heard testimony from people how Lynn would call. Just talk, talk, like to do that. And the phone was on speaker, and he could hear her talking for an hour or longer. And what was one of the things that he told you he heard her say? She had three ways she wanted to commit suicide. Also at the scene, another issue is the rigor mortis. It's undisputed. When did Lynn die? When did she actually die? If, if, if the deputy medical examiner had taken a temperature of her, we might have um, a closer idea, but what we have that we can use is the rigor mortis and the state of it. And it's undisputed and unrebutted. Rigor mortis starts in the jaw, the face, and like and starts to move down to the arms. From there, it goes over the rest of the body, and it, it your trunk of your body becomes uh, rig, has, gets rigor, moves to the large muscles of your legs, and they get rigor. But it hadn't gone to those spots on Lynn. It was at the beginning stages. The deputy medical examiner agreed with with us that it completes within six to eight hours. And she arrived at the scene at 6.10. Deputy medical examiner arrived at 6.10. She said it took her 30 minutes to look at the scene, to photograph, because a lot of the pictures that we've seen over the last three weeks were taken by the deputy medical examiner herself. She took them. So it took her time to look at the scene, look at the body, and so on. But her arrival was at 6.10. The 911 call was made right around 5 o'clock, a few minutes before. It took her a while. So rigor is, is increasing in that time. It's more than an hour, hour and a half even, from the time Jesse arrived at the home until she looks at the body. So it had not moved down to Lynn's trunk. It had not moved to her lower extremities. And so we, and that's consistent too, isn't it, with what Henry said about, Henry Spiller, about the drugs in her system and about how long had they been there. He said a couple hours. Use the phrase a couple hours. So what we can see by that, by the state of that testimony of how long the drugs are in her system and how long, how far the rigor has progressed, that she's only dead a few hours. She died in the afternoon, not in the morning. I pointed out the medical legal investigation of death book. 
by Spitz and Diaz, and Deputy Medical Examiner didn't dispute that what was in there would be authoritative. Lynn was being seen by a lot of physicians. The state has tried to suggest throughout this trial that there was nothing wrong with her, or basically nothing wrong with her. That she was not disabled, not in bad shape. That's what they have, that's how they've presented the case to you, but it's really not true. And anyway, does it really matter objectively what somebody, how somebody might perceive her? Does it more matter how Lynn saw herself? I think that's what really counts. If somebody is going to decide to exit, take their own life, then it's because of how they feel, right? It's not because of how you or you or you or me or anybody uh, sees her medical history. It's how she feels about her life and her, and her pain. And she was in pain. She saw herself as in a lot of pain. And we've got records from pain management that... Back in 2017, the pain interferes with sleep, with da daily activities, and makes her feel frustrated. And at that time, she did the Owestry uh, score and is 31 out of 50. <clears throat> and we introduced the Owestry, uh, Owestry Disability Score. And you know, look at the things that a person rates themselves on. It's how intense the pain is, how intense it is to you how your social life is. Do you have a good social life or not? How is your, you know, sleeping? And how is your employment? And how is your friendships? And all of those things that you just fill it out and you, you let them know how you're feeling about yourself. And apparently, she saw, when, when the, she filled out the answers, we don't know what they were, but however she filled them out, the, the, when, the, when it was graded, she came up with a 31. That's how Lynn saw her life as a 31, which is almost completely disabled, really, as how she saw herself. And the pain interferes with her activities of daily living. It says she... She's had pain for a long time. Look at that. Osteoarthritis in her lower lumbar spine since 1991. Numbness, weakings, weakness in her legs bilaterally. Pain aggravated by her ADLs, activities of daily living. And on her urine screen from September 26, 17, it's appropriate for alprazolam, but inappropriate for lamazepam. It's not prescribed to her. We'll, uh, we'll repeat it another visit. Again, she's not taking the pills the way she's supposed to. She's taking them not as prescribed. And again, they're stopping the opioids. We're going to stop the opioids. And you heard, didn't you, throughout this trial, the dangers of benzos and opioids. And we know that. We know that we did probably even need to have people tell us about it because we know it from what we hear are overdose deaths, the dangers of it. But here, you know, she's got inappropriate pills in her urine screens. She was breaking her hydrocodone in, 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 in half so she could make them last longer. Uh, some things are giving her some relief, and, and some are not, not, but her she's got a lot of risks now, doesn't she? She's got risks of respiratory depression, mortality for taking opioids concurrently with the benzos. Her primary care physician and herself, this doctor, uh, think it's important to stop one of the drugs. And again, again, we've got the osteoarthritis. The problems continue. And they got so bad, didn't they, that she's got so many drugs in her, and along with alcohol, that Lynn's been discharged from the practice, the, her, from her primary care's practice, 
because of noncompliance. And again, inappropriate for alcohol. The state at the beginning of the case, remember, asked their witness, Dr. B, whether there was any evidence in the record that Lynn had any problems with her eyes. No evidence. But it wasn't true. And I know it was painstaking as I was going through those, if we can remember back to day one or two, as I was going through all those medical records with Dr. B, but there was a reason. Because it wasn't true, and I thought it was important that this jury, that you ladies and gentlemen see, that in fact, she'd been complaining about dry eyes and eye pain for a long time. Well, that, those statements weren't factual. Again, she was offered the referral to a pain psychologist. She declines it. Um, she declines nutrition services. She declines uh, physical therapy. And record after record, if you want to see it, you can ask maybe, uh, possibly we can send those back for you to look at. But again, after again, uh, she's encouraged to, to, to exercise, to quit smoking, and to not mix these pain pills. But it isn't just at, at advanced <clears throat> pain management. It's also at Aurora, another facility where she was seen, and, uh, and we can see that she struggled with anxiety. Uh, and they had a discussion, didn't they, with the effects, side effects of taking benzos and opioids and the risk of a morbidity. And so that was a discussion. And, you know, her doctor says due to her pain, all she does is sit around and smoke, sometimes three packs per day. I think there's 20 cigarettes in a pack, that's 60 cigarettes in a day. Day after day, that's all she's doing. Has chest tightness because of it. She continues to complain of GI issues and can eat only very little. So she says, eating very little, yet she's gained 30 pounds since December. I don't know how, how that happens if you're not eating. Again, she comes in for medication management. They told her, I'm not going to increase the benzodiazepines that you're taking. Um, as the dose increases, your side effects increase, and your age increases the side effects. She's now in her 60s. I'm going to try her on Lexapro, a half a tablet. She's got heart palpitations. And she has numerous risk factors. Heart disease, obesity, hyperlipidemia, for which she's refused statins, tobacco use, the recommends stress test. Concerns, the doctor doesn't even list them because there's so many. Instead, she says she has complaints. Complaints are concerns which include numerous in capital letters with an exclamation point. The woman was com a complainer. And I'm not here to bash Lynn, but this is just the person we're dealing with here. She was complaining. And notes such as she has depression or agoraphobia, fear of going out, or uh, she appears older than her age. And psych, she's very argumentative. She seems to be depressed. She seems to be, uh, talks about having nothing since her parents died a few years ago. Told another note, I told her, it's unsafe to take alprazolam and narco. High risk of cardiac death if she continues to take the narco. I will not refill the alprazolam. I can't put my license at risk. That's how bad it had gotten. Can you imagine that in the record? Doctor's afraid of her own medical license. Lynn gets very mad at me and says, I am the one who referred her to pain management. She wants some medication. She really needs to go see someone new for a therapist, but she won't do that. She's depressed. And again, the suggestion that there's no problems with her eyes is uh, not true. December of 2017, she's at, at uh, seeing Dr. Rogers and there is uh, a problem with eyes that is discussed. Uh, she uses artificial tears at least four times a day. So when the state starts their case and asks their witnesses if there are any indication that she's got eye problems, obviously the witness, Dr. B, didn't really take a close look at the records. 
It's just easy to say no. Because they want it to be a death by tetrahydrazoline. Right? That's the decision she made, and they're going to stick with it and not look at the entirety of the woman's medical history to see what's accurate or not. There's another note. This is a new doctor, Abdullah. Now she's discharged from her prim uh, previous primary care physician clinic due to breaching the contract, pain management contract. She tested positive for other substances, she weaned herself off of Oxy, supposedly. Uh, she's, a, she's an only adopted child with no extended family. She lives in a condo she bought and has a couple friends who come visit. She also was at ProHealth. And the main records we know from ProHealth is from her hospital stay from September 15th through September 28th, 2018. That's a long time. Hospital does not keep you there for, well, that looks like um, 13 days, unless, there's some, unless you're not healthy. We know that from our personal experience. Now, the state suggested, didn't they, that Jessie was lying when she said that she brought Lynn pills, <clears throat> lied about a camera, lied about pills, but it was true because it was in the record, uh, which we'll come to in a minute. When she came to the hospital, she was not um, a person that really looked like she, she wanted to keep living because she signed a do not resuscitate. She didn't want chest compression, no shock, no intubation. She's made that decision. And that's when she first arrives on September 15th. That's how she felt. There's the medications sent to the pharmacy for storage. The patient's medications sent to the pharmacy for storage. It was true. When, when, when the information was asked by the state of their own witnesses <coughs> of whether or not there's anything in the record to suggest that Jesse brought medication to Lynn and they said, no, 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 there it is. And who else told you but the neighbor? Remember when the neighbor came over and or testified in court, Jean Tanel, and she also said that Lynn asked her to bring her medications, but she wouldn't do it because of the cameras. So if you don't even want to believe Jesse, certainly have no reason to uh, discount what is said by the neighbor. Pro-health records, the diarrhea, the liquid stools, it's been going on for four years. This is not something recent, the suggestion that somehow Jesse's doing something recently that's causing this, four years. She did meet with palliative medicine, and they help patients and families dealing with serious, potentially life-limiting illnesses and to navigate their care. She seemed upset, refused to talk about doing what the GI was recommending, which was apparently a colonoscopy, but she's in the hospital for almost two weeks. There's something wrong with Lynn. She isn't in good health. She doesn't want to do what... GI recommends. And frankly, um, if you remember, the testimony was that she would be released on the condition that she'd have a full-time caregiver. If not, the record said she was to go to a nursing home. Lynn didn't want to go to a nursing home. Lynn doesn't have full-time care. Another point. Remember, the witnesses were asked by the government, any indication that, that, that Lynn was needing a walker? No, none, none. Another, another thing that's not true. Because again, she began walking with a walker. It's in her medical record. It started before she came to the hospital, and there's a picture at the scene of the walker on the couch. 
she's got lots of past problems. Her medical history is, is, is significant. Don't let anyone tell you it wasn't. It was to her. So the state asked her witness as after witness, remember any indication that Lynn was disabled. They started out their presentation by suggesting that the money she was getting from the federal government was for old age social security. That's what the, they were testifying to until we got them to agree that the, 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 that the money she was getting was for social security disability not for old age Social Security. And remember, there's no indication the witnesses said that she was getting any free things from the government. There's no indication she was on food share or uh, food stamps or Quest, nothing at all. But the certified records were admitted that show that Lynn was in fact getting, and we introduced these, that she was getting free food as early as 2015, or 2015. Sorry, I'm just drawing a blank on my date. I think it goes back earlier than that, for years. Even she was getting it for years. So we've got a woman that the federal government has determined is disabled, to the point that they're going to give her social security disability and the state's giving her food share, which, and it was 2015, I think, when she, uh, she got it even before 2015. Now we did hear the state brought in about the other, the, the other friends. And I have no doubt that they care about Lynn in some way. But the person really who was there day after day, day after day, day after day after day after day to care for Lynn and to watch movies with her and to, and to go shopping and yeah, to, you know, Lynn gave her money, no doubt, it was Jesse. They, they brought in Jim Kareem. I'll get to her in a second, but before her, what about Jim Kelleher? You know, they, the state brings in Jim Kelleher, who wants to deliver a birthday present to her in September. Her birthday was in June. That's a very close friend, isn't it? Who's just thinking about giving a birthday present three months after your birthday. And we do know that, uh, as to Kareen, Hosa, who came in, she had a bit of a poor memory. And I can understand that after the passage of five years, our memories aren't as good as they were back, back when something happened. It's hard to remember precisely. It's hard to remember even nine months later, six months later, sometimes even a week later. So I understand that five years have elapsed. But she denied, remember the discussion with her about the, um, about the safety deposit box. And in the safety deposit box was supposed to be $50,000 that Lynn had put in there. And we asked Ms. Poza, isn't it true that you told police back when you were interviewed originally about this, that Lynn had told you she had taken them, that 50000 out of the safety deposit box, and she said no. But through the questioning of Detective Hoppy, he was able to tell you that actually back when Ms. Poehler <coughs> was interviewed <coughs> four or five years ago, that she did, in fact, tell him that Lynn told her that, the money, that Lynn had taken the money out of the safety deposit box. It wasn't in there anymore. She took her own 50000 out of it. And the state wanted you to think that Jesse did that, that she took 50,000 cash out of it. It was taken out by Lynn, who knows when. Also, on the stand, Ms. Poza 
says, oh, we're such good friends. Lynn and I were such good friends till the end. Very good friends. But back in five years ago, when she was interviewed, and this was verified by Detective Hoppy, when she was interviewed five years ago and asked how good a friend she was with Lynn, that, that time, right after Lynn died, she said, we used to be very good friends. Not so much the last couple of years. Not so much the last couple of years. This group of friends wasn't such good friends the last couple of years. Anthony. Well, Corrine said she last saw Lynn in February 2018. That's a, that's, that's a lot of months for a very good friend. These are the, the, the cards that were brought into court, right? And submitted to the FBI lab, ultimately, as known handwriting of Lynn Hernan. And Anthony Poza ta talked about these documents, and, and he compared these, and he also was talking about another document, wasn't he, in court, where he said, I know that document could not have been written by Lynn, because two reasons. The two reasons were, my mom's name, Corrine, is misspelled. And two, she used my mom's maiden name. Now, as to the second point, let's say if you've been friends with somebody for 30 years, we can all relate to people we've known since high school, we know them by their maiden names. People we've known for a long time, since they were single, we know them by their maiden names. We have them saved by their maiden names. I think of my high school friends by their maiden names. So there's nothing at all suspicious. In fact, it suggests that Lynn probably did write it because what's the chance of Jesse, if that's the suggestion, Jesse knowing what Kareem Pose's maiden name was? But the other point he said was that she couldn't spell, she would never misspell my mom's first name. But then they brought in the cards and her name is spelled differently in almost every card. If you look, Kareem E. Kareem with an E, there's an I in that one. Um, I mean, there's one, two, three, four cards, and every one of them has Kareem spelled differently. Though Lynn couldn't spell first names, apparently. But to suggest, as Anthony did, that the document is, is not written by Lynn because Kareem is misspelled is... Um, Contrary to in what are we know are known documents, because the Posa family brought these in and, and showed them. Of course, uh, they also said, and uh, Kareen also said, did she not, that Lynn was always <coughs> writing things at home. She always had her pad, she was writing wills, she was writing documents that was something Lynn was known for. And she would said there would be documents everywhere, here and there, all around the place. So that's something that Lynn did. That was Lynn. Writing new wills, writing obituaries, writing cards, writing letters, writing notes. That was Lynn. That's something she did, and most likely did even when she was in the hospital sitting there for almost two weeks. When Jean was brought in to court and um, said that, d d denied that she had said Lynn was suicidal, but we established it through the detectives that she was. Remember when the medical examiner was here and we introduced her own data, the medical examiner's own data, to show, does it not, that people do commit suicide? This is for Waukesha County. This is where the years that she provided doc, um, information on. And we have plenty of people in the age range of the 41 to 65 and above. 2020, there's 37 people in that two higher age ranges that, that committed suicide. And how do people com commit suicide? You can see all the ways in Waukesha County that it's happened. And it's sad. We're sad that people ever feel that to that point that they um, 
that, that, that that's what they want to do. But people do it. People do choose to exit. And we have any number of people that have ingestion, inhalation, ingestion type of um, deaths, suicidal deaths, where you ingest some substance. And here, when we ask for the breakdown of what types of products uh, or, or pills that people are taking to kill themselves, we got this breakdown. And remember, Dr. B went through it and she marked how many were actually overdoses from benzoids and benzos and opioids. Very dangerous drugs. Lynn was thinking about her death. She wrote her own obituary. She'd been thinking about her death since uh, at least 2016, because that's when this particular document appears to have been written and notarized by um, one of the bankers at BMO, uh, BMO, who came in here and indicated that's her seal, that's her signature. She, she's the one who notarized this document. Misspelled Jesse's last name. She can't spell names. But Lynn wrote that. Jessie wrote that. She's not going to misspell her own name. Make no mistake about it. Dr. B is called, called this cause of death tetrahydrazoline poisoning. That and that alone. That's what she says the cause of death is. She's never had a tetrahydrazoline death. She has no experience with that at all. Zero. This is the inventory that was taken of all the pills at Lynn's home and what was prescribed and what remained. Zero, 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 one, zero. Lynn took a boatload of drugs. When the first test was requested from NMS Labs, and it came back, what well, didn't even check for baclofen. How is it possible that you really paid attention, doctor, to what was at the home? There's bottles of baclofen here, and you don't ask for baclofen tests to be done. It's a deadly drug. Doc, or Henry Spiller said to you, that's the bad boy. In this case, that was the bad boy. So she's got it. Yeah, she ran a lot of tests because, oops, <laughs> I forgot to check for baclofen. Need to run it again. What were the drugs in her? Baclofen, cyclobenzapine, hydrocodone, alprazolam, nephetapine. Not fatal <coughs> levels, the state says. These therapeutic levels? Therapeutic levels? No. Well known to like drugs and alcohol. That that never changed. Lynn grew up that way, and she stayed that way. Maybe the pills changed, or the alcohol changed, or the drug of choice, or but that's what she did. So it it's just oh, it's, it's so frustrating sometimes. <laughs> just thinking of like how she was. It's, well, I'll tell you this: she didn't overdose on any kind of prescription medication. Okay. Everything was a therapeutic level. Therapeutic level. You no. Know, Dr. B testified that Visine, which is uh, the product we know with tetrahydrosoline in it, um, testified about it. We know it's been on the market since 1959. We didn't hear about any reported deaths. She says it's outlawed in France. That's not true. It's not outlawed in France. It's not approved. No one sought approval. It's not outlawed. It's being careful with our words. Not trying to mislead you, ladies and gentlemen, of the jury in this case. There is no evidence presented that any company was denied approval of, of tetrahydrosoline or Visine in France. <coughs> it's misleading, as was 
Dr. Kosinko's abstract, misleading. She put statistics on there, statistical trickery. Well, maybe that's a little harsh on her. Maybe that might hurt a little bit to hear that. But that's how Henry described it. He is so experienced in this area of toxicology. He's peer-reviewed toxicology articles for other people that, that want to uh, print them and have them published. He's the peer reviewer, one of them, not of his own, of course, and it wouldn't pass muster. And I understand that she's a younger scientist. I understand that she wants to find a novel subject to write about. I understand wanting to be recognized. But this is only an abstract. It's not even a written article, much less submitted for peer review, much less next step go to be published in any kind of literature. Henry, on the other hand, has uh, written and published uh, at the Nobel level. I mean, we're talking over 200. A 44-page curriculum vitae, CV. These were the positive findings that came through. And look at what she has in her system. It's just incredible to see the number of drugs and the quantities of the drugs, and maybe one alone, fine, but the combination, deadly. Dr. Thomas said it was a polydrug overdose. Where does, uh, where does tetrahydrazoline rate in the dangerousness of the drugs, according to Henry Spiller, world-renowned expert in toxicology, at the bottom of the list? At the bottom of the list. Remember also Dr. Kosinko bringing in an article that in her rebuttal, she came back up for like a last rebuttal, she brings in some article that is from somebody she met at a conference. It's been cited twice. In other words, no one's citing that article. It's cited twice. It's not well received in the toxicology community because it's not being cited. Now, Henry Spiller is able to, with his decades of experience of working at national poison control centers, where he's doing real-time work with people in hospitals who are in for overdoses. And, uh, and he is dealing with the doctors and the nurses and the, the hospitalists and the emergency room people. And he's trying to calculate what's going on and what's in their system. Remember, a girl says, I've got 20... I took 20 Tylenol, and he looks, he says, no way, didn't take 20. I know based upon the levels I'm seeing, it's 30 or 40, whatever the number was. He knows that. He does that. It's what he does to save people's lives. And he follows the patients, doesn't he? From the minute he gets the call from a hospital that somebody's on an overdose through their discharge or their death. He knows how to calculate how many pills. Nobody else knows how to do that that, brought, that was in this trial. And he calculated that Lynn has 33 to 42 tablets. And it's higher than it was originally because other drugs were found. Because remember, there were pills in her belly, right, that were never tested. But he did the calculation 33 to 42 pills. That is a boatload of pills, consistent with this boatload of pills, bottles, mostly empty, not all, found at the scene. And nobody's shoving 33 to 42 pills down somebody's throat. No way. Remember, Lynn was a savvy pill taker. She'd been taking pills and all sorts of pills for a long time. No one's going to trick her on her pills. Lynn knows what she's doing. She's been taking them for years. And there's no indication in the record that anything was forced because I specifically asked if there's any sign of injury to a mouth, to a throat. 
any a trachea, anything to suggest that there's any kind of forced ingestion, and there isn't. There is not. She took them herself because she wanted to. And as to those other cases that were cited by um, Dr. Kosinko, for example, Henry Spiller actually calculated the amount of tetrahydrosoline that was in that child at peak. 115 ng per milliliter. Now there's a scarcity of cases. You think that, there, that we should be able to come in here and, and show you case after case after case of tetrahydrosoline and what levels should be, but there aren't. If they were out there, we would have them here for you to see. But there is that case where he's able to do the calculation. 115 Lin was 160. 115 had a little bit of problems, uh, a little bit of respiratory uh, uh, depression, used a little mask of oxygen on the child, rapid improvement. That's what 115 NG per ml does to a little child. And he made a point to let you all know that children are not little adults. The effects on a child are of, of uh, any kind of drug are going to be much, uh, much higher, they're stronger than that on any that on an on an adult. Yeah, the five um, the five pills, five pills found in Lynn that. The medical examiner never tested and, in fact, didn't know what they were, never bothered to figure out what they were until we <coughs> met with her and pointed out the number 30 on one of them, and couldn't that be uh, nephetapine? And between that date and when she came into court, she agreed. She looked it up to see if we were right, which we were. She said, you were right. None of this was taken into consideration by her at all. Never tested them. What kind of medical examiner, when you're talking about a poisoning, so fixated on the THC? Why did she fixate on it? She'd never seen it before. I agree. Probably, if she says that, it's probably true. It's Sherry Kosinko from NMS Labs who was all excited, wasn't she, about, at that time, about this high level of THC because she's wanting to do this article. She's got an abstract. She's getting... Her lab automatically tests for THC, and now she's got this case with a high level. She wants to be recognized. She wants to cite it. So she gives a suggestion to, to Dr. B that this is fatal. This is what killed her. Because what other evidence is there of it? There's not. It's not true. A lot of drugs in her system. Dr. Thomas told you that. Mr. Spiller told you that. You can see the charts for yourself. It is um, just an incredible number of pills. And Lynn wasn't healthy. Dr. Thomas was careful to tell this, tell all of you about the other problems with Lynn, like her fatty liver disease, which shows the the alcoholism, the stenosis that. She, she would have thought um, if there wasn't anything with drugs that there would have been a heart issue that might have killed her. Her obesity, she's 251 pounds of death. How did she gain? You know, from earlier records, where we see 50, 100 pounds. It's this incredible weight gain. She's type 2, di type two diabetic, the pulmonary disease, the interstitial myocarditis, the heart hypertension woman had a lot of a lot of health problems. And Jim Berg was in, in court to talk about her finances too. He said that she was broke. She knew she was broke, tying into financial things. 
Um, this wasn't news to her. But before I leave on the medical part of it, remember Henry Spiller said that he did write an article about tetrahydrosoline and its effect in sexual assaults. And he said he wrote it and did the research on it because he wanted the FBI to, to adapt, adopt this as one of the standard tests that they use when, when rape kits are done. And, and of course, when the FBI makes recommendations, you don't have a, a, a city or a state is free to reject or accept them. But his goal was to get the FBI to recognize the THC, uh, to, to make the testing for THC a part of the recommended national protocol, I think is what he said, when they're testing blood or urine. And that's probably, isn't it, why NMS labs ultimately put the testing for tetrahydrosoline in their regular testing regimen because they get all blood for, or urine to test in all sorts of cases. People use the lab, not just because somebody died, but for any reason, including you could send urine for a rape test. And so they accepted that recommendation, it seems, and put that as part of their regular testing. So when it comes to first degree intentional homicide, the state has not proven it. They have the burden to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They didn't do that. They failed. Such a serious charge. Defendants aren't required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with a commission of an offense to be innocent. The burden of establishing every fact is on the state. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you must do so. You must do so. Return a verdict of not guilty. And as to the homicide, that's exactly what we have here, an absolutely reasonable hypothesis of the defendant's innocence. And you must return a verdict of not guilty if you agree with that. There are other words in jury instructions, such as you should. But here, this one is must. It's must. Of course, the last part of the instruction, and what no doubt the state will indicate to you when they get back up here, I don't get a second turn. They'll say, you know, it's your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, but you're not to search for doubt, you're to search for the truth. But by their own admission, all we have here is circumstantial evidence. There is really, that's all it is. It's a circumstantial evidence case. I don't know, it's not easy to search when you're missing so much information, like testing of pills and saving of evidence at a scene. And I did, and I hope you can see my chart, because I think it's important to look at how, what, it, what does that even mean, reasonable doubt, or proof beyond a reasonable doubt? It's such a, ter it's such a legal term. It's hard to, hard to understand it. But you can look at this chart and kind of get an idea. If there's no trace of evidence, of course, well, that would be not guilty. But even if there's any evidence at all, a scintilla of evidence that would require a not guilty. If you have a reasonable suspicion, which should be based on specific or particular facts or reasons, it's not based on a hunch or a guess, so it's more than a hunch or a guess, call that a reasonable suspicion, not guilty. What about if you've got probable cause? You hear that all the time, in, even if you're watching TV. 
Uh, we got probable cause, we're going to get a warrant, or probable cause for this or that. Reasonable and trustworthy information that a particular person has committed a particular crime. What if we have that, if you think that there's that here? That's not guilty. Well, let's go even higher on the chart and think about what if we've got the greater weight or amount of evidence. In other words, there's a greater weight of the state's evidence compared to the defense evidence. If you felt that, which I don't, based upon Dr. Thomas and Henry Spiller, but if you felt it, it still requires a not guilty because that's only a preponderance of the evidence. That is inadequate to convict. Even if you have a firm belief that the allegations are true, in other words, clear and convincing evidence, you must vote not guilty. That requires not guilty. And if there's any reasonable doubt, it's not guilty. Only if the state presented evidence that went on that ladder, those stairs, all the way up here, would you be able to vote guilty. And I submit that as to the first degree, intentional homicide, the intentional taking of Lynn Hernan's life, that they have not proven their case. I do want to talk to you about the financial things. So, the state suggests that Jesse was taking all this money from Lynn. Actually, Lynn and Jesse were close, and Jesse, Lynn gave Jesse money all the time because she wanted to. And Lynn spent a lot of money before Jesse was even even on the scene. We took the total account balances, and you can look at it if you want to dig through the, the financial records. We've added things up. And you can see that in 2014, she started with 346000 And by January 15 of 2015, she's down to 305000 And by January of 2016, we have her down to $272,000. And the first check that was written to Jesse, ladies and gentlemen, was in July of 2016. And this continues on for the rest of the the rest of the uh, the accounting. But remember, the, the first checks to Jesse are in July of 2016, and the FBI, who we brought in here, again, the state did not bring in the FBI. They didn't want you to hear from the FBI. The checks written to Jesse, she rated them as a common source. Support for common source. Now I know that this chart is not the easiest chart to understand. I had to have it hammered in my head again and again. So of course, if they're, they never say they're certain, apparently the FBI doesn't do that. But we've got inconclusive in the middle. We're not sure. As we move to the right, it's li more likely that the person wrote it. And as it moved to the left, it's more likely the person didn't write it. That's really how this goes. So all the checks that were written to Jesse, the, the name, Jesse Krzyzewski, not always spelled correctly, and the numerals were, writ were support for common source for Lynn. That Lynn likely wrote the Jesse's name and the amounts. As to the signature, the Lynn Hernan signature, because of the lack of clarity in documents that she had at her disposal, she was inconclusive. That isn't a support for a different source. It's inconclusive. And I think there was a suggestion during this trial, as I recall, somebody suggesting, well, if Lynn had duplicate checks, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't Jesse be able to duplicate her signature from the duplicate check? Well, first of all, that's a if, if, if. There's nothing in this record that Lynn had duplicate checks. So that would be a guess. We're not here for guessing. If Lynn had duplicate checks, bring in somebody from the bank, from the deluxe check ordering company, 
the state should do that, right? And, and say that Lynn had duplicate checks. There's nothing in this record that she had. But second point, um, we know, don't we, from our duplicate checks that the signature is blocked out. They've done that for years on duplicate checks just for the purpose that if somebody steals your checkbook or you misplace it, you lose it, that people aren't going to see your signature. So that's just, re that's just ridiculous. Now we have known writing of Lynn. This was known writing of Lynn. Lynn liked to spend money. She liked to give money away. She liked to spend beyond her means. She liked to give away beyond her means. That's what she did. And giving money to Jessie made her happy. Jessie was like her daughter. Jessie was the person who was there all the time. And Jessie probably gave her a hard luck story. I need money for this and money for that. But Lynn was happy to give it to her. The crime requires that it be without her consent. There's no evidence here that Lynn didn't consent. Lynn, in fact, gave the money willingly to Jessie. She liked to spend money, and she liked to give it away. As I told you, check num item numbers 47 through 56 and 58 through 83. Those were uh, support for the writing being of Lynn's. She wrote the body of those checks. And the two in between that, I should point out, because you might be wondering, well, where's 50 or 67? Uh, oh, I think this 57. Uh, they were confirmed as Lynn's signature. A look at how her spending dramatically increased. So here we've got Lynn going to the hospital. She got $19,000. She has a discussion on September 21st with palliative care and spend, 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 spend. Once she knows that she has to either go in a nursing home, which she doesn't want to do, she's made a decision. And it's spent and spending. And that's when the ATM withdrawals began. And Lynn liked to have cash. Of course she sent Jesse to do things for her. Lynn's just charged from the hospital and she's down quite a bit of money and is all after her discussion with, with hospital people about the palliative care, having to go into a nursing home or having full-time care at her home. Withdrawal, withdrawal, withdrawal. When, okay, now think about the two loans you heard about in this trial. You heard that Lynn applied for a loan first with her uh, primary bank, which is BMO, BMO Harris. And there, if you looked at the documents carefully, she did exaggerate her income was exaggerated about 50%. She did note on those applications exactly what she had in the bank, and the application was done face to face. In other words, she was there at the bank doing the application, and she put down how much money she had in her bank account, and it was under $20,000. The suggestion has been made that Lynn was being taken advantage of and had no idea of her finances. False. She knew she put it on her loan application. Now that was denied. So by increasing her income by 50%, she doesn't get the loan. So they together decide to make the application for Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, they put up a, a, its income of, of $100,000. It's obviously poor underwriting, never looked into anything but they accepted the documents and they gave the loan, they approved it. And on the day of the disbursement, the key thing is, Jessie added Lynn to her Wells Fargo account. She was added. And as to switching the names uh, and adding her to the account, that was done in person too. We brought in the, the, uh, the man that, um, did that form with 
Lynn and Jesse at the bank, and he told you. You'd be there in person, in front of him, with identification, to prove who they are. Not only that, but he's so careful to make sure that people are not being taken advantage of, that, that both the customer and the, you know, both, both people, both customers before him, are not being taken advantage of, that are in a good mental state, that they know what they're doing, and that all, in fact, we heard that all the banks do that. That's part of protocol. They just make sure that they don't see anything, that somebody isn't nudging somebody or signing for them or whispering and telling them what to do. So they did go for a loan, and there were obviously falsities told about the Lynn's income of 100000 <clears throat> but she wanted the money. Because by the time that February of 2018 rolled around, she didn't have much money in the bank. <clears throat> she just applied for the loan at, at, at uh, BMO, and she had listed her assets at under $20,000. So Lynn was well aware in February 2018 that she only had $20,000. As to the theft from Lynn during her life, the state has failed to prove it. The record before us shows that Lynn gave Jesse the money willingly. She had no one else to give her money to. You can understand, you, you might question it if somebody has heirs that are alive, like children, grandchildren, that you might want to leave your money to, but Lynn did not. She wanted Jesse to have it. She knows she's going out. She's giving it to Jesse. It is a lot of money. It's a tremendous amount of money. But just because it's a lot of money doesn't mean that Lynn didn't approve of it. And in fact, it's the evidence suggests she did. Jesse was the person that was there. No one else really knew Jesse. I knew Lynn like Jesse. She knew her. They're the ones that spent time every day, twice a day, together. And Lynn made a decision. She made a decision that she was going to exit. And she, she did that on October 3rd, once Jesse had left the home. We know it was then because of how long the body was deceased. The body was not dead in the morning the rigor would have spread. That's just false. She put on her father's dog tags. That's a sentimental thing to do. That's when you're thinking about going to another place to be with your loved ones, you're going to join my father, you join your father, join her father, the person that she loved so much. She put on his dog tapes. And I don't mean that in a mean way. I mean it truthfully. She did a lot for me. So the fact of her being dead would do what for me? Well, the debt's kind of coming up to, to, to overtake the assets. She has more credit debt than she has money. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So the money's running out. Yeah. So... But I don't get what you mean by that. I mean, yeah, they were. I don't understand what you're saying. The fact is, is she paid you two hundred thousand dollars over the last two years. Mm -hmm. If you're the partner, you are handling the money. You are on mm -hmm. the signer on the accounts. Yeah. You are running the show. Yeah. You are handling the credit card stuff. Mm -hmm. You know what's going on financially with her. Mm -hmm. The the money is going to be gone here shortly. So I would kill her because of that? People do weird things. Why would I kill her for money? I mean, it's just... It's my family. I, I, I tend to think that you didn't... When you say kill her... I, I, don't, it's just, I, mean, I, I, I don't think you killed her. I think she was sick. And she didn't want to... She was done. No. And she wanted to, to finish her, her life. And she needed help. 
And even if you think, as the detective did, that that's what Jesse did, that is not, that is not a first degree intentional homicide, which is what is charged here. Look at the elements of the crime, that is not it. Even the detective thought it. As to count two, the state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Lynn did not consent to giving Jesse that money. And in fact, she did consent. And remember, if you can reconcile the evidence on count two, the theft while Lynn was alive, with any reasonable hypothesis consistent with Jesse's innocence, you must do so. You must do so and return a verdict of not guilty. As to count three, which is the theft from the estate, uh, really the only comment I would make to you, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard during the case, the estate's not even closed. The estate is still open. When you, reach, when you go to the jury room and you deliberate and you look at all this evidence and if you want to see something, send a note. We'll send it if we can. I ask you to return verdicts of not guilty. The state has not proven their case. The, ver the only true and correct verdicts are not guilty. And thank you.